and let us all that we can to build a better future. So Piers Morgan, I'm going to give him credit here. He's had a lot of phenomenal guests on to talk about and defend uh, what is what's what the people of Palestine are going through. And, you know, Piers Morgan, he has his own biases and perspectives and points of view. He's had Andrew Tate on, Bassem Youssef, Jeremy Corbyn, and so many others who are trying to call out the actions of the apartheid government in Israel. Um, but however, this next guest, Norman Finkelstein, uncensored, no holds bars, I think more or less lays down the academic and intellectual point about why, why what's happening in Gaza needs to be addressed. And uh, of course, Pierce Morgan is going to ask him the same question uh, that he's asked all the other previous guests as well. Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn it? So I think it's only fair that we hear from Norman Fikultzin himself. So let's play this video. Given you know the full scale of this attack, I've asked a lot of guests this, these two questions, and I'd be curious about your answer. One, would you categorize it as a terror attack? And secondly, would you condemn Hamas for what they did? My view is as follows. Number one, as far as the evidence shows now, atrocities occurred on October 7th. The magnitude of the atrocities and the types of atrocities, for example, where children beheaded, where women raped, that remains, so far as I can tell from the evidence, an open question. However, that there were atrocities that occurred, my answer is yes. Number two, that's a, that's a factual question. Then there well, was the question was, was question. it a terror attack? Yeah. Well, atrocities, it seems to me, denotes a terror attack. Okay, thank that's you. That's what atrocities okay. are. Thank you. Okay. So, number two, that's the factual question. And then there is the legal question. As a matter of law, it seems unquestionable that the people who perpetrated these atrocities would be prosecuted and convicted in a court of law. However, I would say on the legal question, I should think that there would be some mercy shown because those who carried out the atrocities were concentration camp inmates. Number three, which I think is the one that concerns you the most, is the moral question. And at a moral level, my view is, my basic precept, we may disagree, my basic precept is that there but for the grace of God go I. That is to say, I'm very reluctant to condemn people who are in a position or in a condition such that were I in that position or condition, I'm not sure what I would do. That's a big question that we have to ask ourselves. And we've seen this story get repeated over and over again. Um, one group, nation, city-state oppressing another group or nation. It's unfortunately been following us through all of human civilization. And we do have to ask ourselves, what would we do if we were in their shoes? How would you react if you were in Gaza right now? If you had family members who were taken away, beaten, or executed, how would you feel knowing that you and your family have been living in an open-air prison for generations? How would you feel knowing that water, electricity, heat, food can be cut off at a moment's notice? I think for many of us, we just can't think about it. Like we, we, We've never dealt with something of that magnitude. But it is an interesting question that we have to propose to ourselves. How would we react? And I could say with absolute confidence, if some nation or superpower or external threat, not of this world, were to do this to the United States, to all, uh, to all the, my fellow Americans, if that was to happen to us, I know for a fact that we would be upset, we'd be, we, would, we would be enraged, and we would push back. It's human nature. We don't like having our necks stepped on by the jackboot of an authority. And we do have to push back. So I think Norman does bring up a very good point of how would he react? He wouldn't know. 
but it's understandable why there's anger. And unfortunately, even though it is being reported that there is a ceasefire, uh, recently there are reports now, and I just want to pull this up here, unfortunately, um, of further um, fighting taking place. I want to uh, at least acknowledge a hot spot for pulling up this video here. So it's not even 24 hours uh, has gone by and Israel's already broken a temporary ceasefire with IDF troops firing on civilians. More worryingly, we're also hearing that despite an Israeli order for people who are displaced not to head back from the south of the Gaza Strip to their homes in the north, some people have been trying to do so. Uh, they've broken off trying to use side roads, and we're hearing that several people have been wounded by Israeli ground forces opening fire. With more. So let's go ahead and play the rest of this video here. Now, the 1,500 young men who burst the gates of Gaza, they were born into a concentration camp. They lived for two decades in a concentration camp. They had no past, they had no present, they had no future, they had no jobs. Half of them, according to humanitarian organizations, suffered from what's called severe food insecurity. And then on top of that, as I'm sure you know, Pierce, because you keep up with the news, periodically Israel goes into Gaza and it mows the lawn. And you know what mows the lawn means. It means a high-tech massacre in Gaza. In 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead. 2012, Operation Tiller of the Fence. 2014, Operation Protective Edge. And in each of these high-tech massacres visited on the people of Gaza, in some cases, hundreds, in some cases, thousands of Palestinians are killed. So I'll pull up this next video here as well. We do have to look at how Norman Finkelstein, Professor Finkelstein, answers the question of how he thinks his parents, who were both Holocaust survivors, would have reacted to October 7th. Because in previous interviews and debates, you know, there have been people who have been saying that Norman Finkelstein is being anti-Semitic, that he is being uh, harsh. He does, he's 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 not even looking at what's happening uh, with Gaza, uh, with with the Israeli perspective. I think it's important to note that uh, Norman's parents, are, again, are both Holocaust survivors. They were in the concentration camp. I want to pull this video up. I am I'm, I'm not going to pause. I think it's only fair that we hear his full words. So let's listen to it in its full entirety. You but are the son of two people who survived the Holocaust, who were both in concentration camps. Uh, you're, you're a Jewish man. Uh, and you know how incendiary that substack has proven to be with Jewish people around the world, who many of whom have felt this is the nearest thing to the Holocaust of World War II that they've endured. What your parents went through, being revisited on them in these kibbutzes on October the 7th. Um, what do you feel about them? I mean, how would your parents have felt about you literally on the day that this happened, talking about heroic resistance, talking about that you will never begrudge the scenes, uh, that you, the stars in heaven are looking kindly down, glory, glory, the souls of Gaza go marching on. How would your parents have felt about that, coming out of concentration camps, surviving the Holocaust of World War II. I know I said I wouldn't pause, but I just have to add this in here. Yeah, You have to remember, Gaza is an open-air prison. And many of these people have been suffering for a very long time. And this has been an ongoing thing that's been going on for 75 years in which many of the people in Gaza and the West Bank have been systematically been losing their homes, their friends, their families, their livelihoods, and all this action, all this brutality, of course there's going to be resentment and pushback. You only could push a person for so long until they snap. This is human nature. Well, first of all, anything I write, I have my parents looking at the screen, 
behind me over my shoulders. In a metaphorical sense, I am very conscious every moment of my existence, every moment of my existence goes back to the martyrdom of my family. So it's not as if suddenly you're posing a question to me that never occurred to me. Quite the contrary, I do need even 30 years after their death, I need the moral validation that came from my parents' martyrdom and the extermination of their family. How would my parents have reacted? My guess is if on the first day they heard that inmates in a concentration camp burst its gates, I think my parents would be very pleased at that fact. As the events became clearer, my guess, but this is pure speculation, my guess is my parents would go out with their hearts, would go out to those who burst the gates of the concentration camp and whose lives were destroyed. Now, you will say to me, completely legitimately, you would say, well, what would your parents feel about the innocents who were slaughtered in the atrocities on that day? So I'm going to give you as close an answer as I could give, I, as I'm able to. I once asked my late mother, I said to her, what was your feeling when you heard that the German cities were being terror bombed during World War II, the carpet bombing of the German cities targeting civilians. What was your feeling? And my mother's response to me was, quote, our feeling was if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. Now that's not the most morally elevated statement. I agree. And do I wish my mother had and my father had a heightened sensitivity to German civilian life? I suppose I would wish it. But I will tell you, Piers, to the last day of my parents' life, it was unthinkable that they would have a kind word to say about Germans. And it was unthinkable that I would ever quarrel with them on that point. Okay. I accepted, I accepted that given their life experience, they okay. had the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Okay. And the people Professor of Gaza have the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Professor Figgelstein. Nothing that uh, Nor uh, Norman Fickelstein said was incorrect. People do have a right to defend themselves. People do have a right to push back. People do have a right to get angry. Now, here's here's the unfortunate truth. Because of this ongoing conflict and because of the ongoing bombings and this ceasefire that is apparently taking place, air quotes, we're going to see the next conflict 10 years down the road. I wish that wasn't the case at all. I wish that there was peace in our time. I wish that there was uh, an opportunity for uh, understanding. But with the amount of destruction that we witness on social media on both sides, it is abundantly clear that many of our U.S. officials could have stepped in at any point in time to stop it. I think none of us really can understand the fact of what it would be like if we were in the position of the people in Gaza. You know, there's a hill where uh, unfortunately Israelis are watching the bombings taking place and having uh, fantastic snacks and meals as people's homes and hospitals and refugee camps are being blown up. You can't look me in the eye and tell me that that's not going to build further resentment. 
All of this, in theory, could have been avoided. I want to pull up another video here. It's of uh, Pierce Morgan uh, and Norman Finkelstein discussing about humanity and trying to see better in each other. I want to pull up this video here. It's difficult to sit through this stuff because I just, I just, I see, I see the next crisis happening. The seeds have already been planted. And many years from now, we're going to have the same conversation again. Something has got to change. Let's pull up this video here. Pierce, I'm really, and I'm trying to be candid with you. Number one, I appreciate your humanity. I do. I don't know you from Adam. I'm not a TV or a television or a social media kind of person. I'm a book person. I'm old fashioned. However, I do recall that when that famous moment when Susan Boyle appeared on Britain's Got Talent, and I remember the camera turning to you, focusing on you, I could see it in my mind's eye. I saw your eyes narrow, and suddenly the humanity in you came up. Here is this obscure woman whose talent had gone unrecognized. And if I can speak to that same program, for me, the most poignant moment, the one I carry with me my entire, since that moment, was when Simon Cowell asked um, Susan Boyle, well, why haven't you been discovered yet? And she replied, because I haven't been given a chance. And that's how I feel about the people of Gaza. That's how I feel about those young men in Gaza. You ask me why I won't condemn them. Because those young men were born into a concentration camp. They were born into among the most dense popul uh, populated places on, on God's earth. Half of the population of Gaza's children, 70% are refugees who were expelled from Israel in 1948 and their descendants. 70% of those of Gaza's youth have no jobs, no future, no nothing. They are Susan Boyle times 10,000, never given a chance. And as things looked the night before October 7th, when the question of Gaza was disappearing from the public stage. I will admit to you, Piers, I myself had given up on Gaza. In 2020, I decided it's hopeless, it's pointless, I only have a finite number of years left in my life, and it's time for me to move on. And I'll tell you, that was a wrenching decision on my part because I knew I was abandoning the people who for 15 years I had devoted my life to chronicling every detail of the horror that had been inflicted on those people. And I gave up on them. Okay. And that meant if I gave up, they had no future because I was the last chronicler. Okay. But what I was I want to pause here. I'll just keep it short here. But uh look, those that statement was not an easy thing to hear because there does come a point to where you see the const you you see where things are playing out. And I guess we could relate it to U.S. politics here where many of us are burnt out by electoral politics. Many of us are disillusioned by our leaders. Many of our quote-unquote heavyweight champions and the, 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 the self-proclaimed defenders of justice and liberty, many of our politicians, remained indifferent as the death toll kept on rising and rising, and hey, it's still rising up. None of uh, the progressive senators progressive air quote centers like Bernie Sanders or Warren really did anything to really, you know, push the need or hold Biden's feet to the fire, the call for a ceasefire and nothing changed. 
we're still doing ongoing wars and our politicians are all, all what they're all, all what they really want to raise the alarm about is, oh, no, here comes Donald Trump. It's not a, it, it's I don't want to say give up because that's that's not the case. But there there are points where every one of us has that has that moment where we cross that river and say it. I see where this is playing out. It's hopeless. But don't give up. It's, we have to if we. If we don't push forward and hold true to our own beliefs and the need to fight for a better future, nothing is truly going to change. But we have to remember why we have to step up our game and why we have to get more involved, especially at the local, state, and federal level. Because the reason why things are bad right now domestically and worldwide is because of our own indifference. And it's time for us to step up. And I think many of us for a long time hoped that maybe electoral politics or whoever is going to be president is going to change the world. And then we could rest easy knowing that it's all done. Eternal vigilance. That's what we need to do. Say, guys, uh, all right, but what I, I was, have the only right, book but, but professor, that's been written on the subject. Respond. Let me respond. What I respond, I would respond by saying that what people in Israel would say and what Jewish people would say, particularly who live in Israel, is that they were facing a constant barrage of rockets from Hamas, that Hamas won political power in 2005 six. that they were given a huge amount of money uh, and could have done whatever they wanted with that money, but chose to pursue a path of effectively terrorizing uh, the Israelis over that period. And the Israelis, you're right, they responded in a, they have a far superior military, and they responded in the way that they did. And this cycle has been going on and repeat and repeat and repeat. But where you and I differ about this is that I think what happened on October the 7th was just uh, on a different scale to anything we've seen and the way it was carried out. And I just don't think saying that people who have been oppressed, which they undoubtedly were for many years, that that justifies them committing that act of terror. I want to end this video segment here by more so saying that we are we are at a point of no return. And obviously, I think it's quite clear, unfortunately, that the people of Gaza are going to continue to be displaced from their homes. The international community has more or less been indifferent. Yes, we've seen reports how many nations are, you know, breaking ties or condemning Israel. But to quote Bassem Yusuf, you condemn Israel, I condemn Hamas, nothing changes. Unfortunately, the path that we're on is for another conflict, another brutal back and forth fight. And when people are pushed to their limit, they will react aggressively. I, I want to say that maybe now there could be peace talks. Maybe now there could be understanding. But that's lying. We have to look at the other person and what they're going through. What caused them to react this way. And if these ongoing policies continue on, then we should not be surprised when there is violent pushback. All. What this war has done is lay the foundations for further suffering. I want to play this video of Norman Finkelstein in the past, though. It's when uh, he is being confronted by a student at a university. This video has already gone viral. We've, we've seen it numerous times. But I think it's important that we just see it again play out. Because it's important to remember why we need to have this conversation so that history doesn't repeat itself again. Unfortunately, it looks like it is, but let's play it. And I don't respect the crocodile tears to, to, to the crocodile tears. No, uh, answer, folks, um, allow me to finish and allow me to, allow me to speak. Listen, sir. Allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Uh, sir, sir, I don't like to play. I don't like to play the foreign audience the Holocaust card. 
But since now I feel com- now that I feel compelled to, my late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother, please shut up. My late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother was in my Danish concentration camp. Every single member of my family. On my father's side, on my... Hold on, apologies. There seems to be a little bit of background music. Hold on. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated. Both of my parents were on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's in precisely and exactly because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings that I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. And I consider nothing more despicable than to use their suffering and their martyrdom to try to justify the torture, the brutalization, the dem- demolition of homes that Israel daily commits against the Palestinians. So I refuse any longer to be intimidated or browbeaten by the tears. If you had any heart in you, you would be crying for the Palestinians, not for what you done. One more video. The irony is that the Nazi Holocaust has now become the main ideological weapon for launching wars of aggression. Every time you want to launch a war of aggression, drag in the Nazi Holocaust. It's the suffering then used as another pretext or excuse to humiliate, degrade, and torture the Palestinians. That's the problem. The suffering comes as a package. It then comes, here is the suffering, now we blow up your house. Here is the suffering, now we take your land. Here is the suffering, now we drop artillery shell or shoot artillery shells at your villages. It's a package deal with Israel and its American supporters. It's not just suffering. It's suffering, which is then wrapped in a club. And the club is then used to break the skulls of the Palestinians. That's the problem. It's not being used to educate people. It's not being used to enlighten people. It's not being used to make people more moral. It can be. But it's not. I mean... It's not. That's the whole point. Of course it can be, but it isn't. It's the best thing that will ever happen to Israel if they get rid of these American Jews who are warmongers from Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard. That sounds familiar. I swear. Wasn't there a situation that took place, so I don't know, a couple of... Maybe a year ago, some migrants were dropped off at the front doorstep, and those are probably the same homes that say, love is in this house. We welcome everybody. Hate's not allowed here. Whatever happened to those migrants that showed up at the front door? Oh, that's right. They were kicked out the day after. And they're warmongers from the hemp. It's, 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 it's almost as if, it's, it's almost as if, you know, we, we're, we're seeing that being played out in real time right now. And that's the whole point. Of course it can be, but it isn't. It's the best thing that will ever happen to Israel if they get rid of these American Jews who are warmongers from Martha's Vineyard. And they're warmongers from the Hamptons. And they're warmongers from Beverly Hills. And they're warmongers from Miami. It's been a disaster for Israel. You know, it's the best thing if they can ever get rid of this American jury. It's a curse. And unfortunately, with all curses, <sighs> the price is yet to be fully paid yet. So curses, it's all one big curse. The world is cursed. Folks, at least for this day, Let us at least look back at those that have been raising the alarm and raising the issue about what's happening in Gaza. Unfortunately, I don't think anything's going to change. 
It's just going to get worse. And we are lacking real leadership. So the ball is in our court to say enough.